for Jung, the pathway to higher wisdom was through the terrible portal of, well, you could say hell for that matter. Really? And, and so who wants to do that, man? It's like, no. You know, like maybe you're resentful about something. Well, you probably are, because like everybody's resentful about something, you know? And resentment is just a vicious emotion. It's really useful. It's really useful, because if you're resentful about something, it either means that you should grow the hell up and accept the responsibility and quit sniveling around and whining, or it means that someone actually is oppressing you and, and pushing on you too hard and bullying you and demeaning you, and you have something to say or do that you're not saying or doing. And no wonder you're not saying or doing it, because, you know, it can be really dangerous to say things or do them to free yourself from from being oppressed, you can get in a lot of trouble in the short term for doing it, so it's easier just to not say anything, sort of day after day. In the short term you protect yourself, but it just crushes you. And then the, the resentment comes up, and resentment, man, that can just get so out of hand, you know. It starts with resentment, and then it starts, it, it goes to the desire for revenge, you know, because you'll play nasty little tricks on the person that's oppressing you. At any chance, you'll talk about them behind their back, and, if they want you to do something, you'll do it badly, or you'll do it grudgingly, or you'll do a half-rate job, and you'll set up little traps, and, you know, so it puts you in a poisonous space, and then if that, if you really start to dwell on that, say, in your basement for three or four years about just exactly how terrible the world is, and how that's focused on you, and how everyone's rejected you, and how you get to this point where you're thinking that, you know, existence itself is a kind of poisonous endeavor, and that, the best thing for you to do is go out there and do as much, you know, create as much mayhem as you possibly can. And if you really get to a dark place, you think, I'm going to create as much mayhem as I possibly can by targeting the most innocent thing I can possibly imagine. And then you end up shooting kids in Connecticut. And that's how you get there. And so, that's a bad road, man. There's dark things down there. But you can go there, and people do. And they go through the hole of resentment. And so, Resentment can tell you, you've got something to say, you bloody well better say it. You gotta free yourself from what's oppressing you. You have to stand up for that, because otherwise you become oppressed. And then once you're oppressed, that's just not so good. And so, like in your marriage, and your relationships, you gotta tell people what you're thinking. You don't have to assume you're right. That's a whole different story, because you're not, because you're, you know, ignorant. And, you're biased and, you know, so you're not right, but you can stumble towards your, this, the expression of yourself and then you can listen to the other person and hope that they tell you some way that you're stupid that's useful so you can be a little less stupid in the future because that, wouldn't that be good? And so, you know, you go after the unknown. You don't protect what you know, you already know what you know. You go after what you don't know. That's why you have to talk to people you don't agree with. That's why you have to talk to your enemies. Because they're going to tell you things you don't know. You could even listen to them. It's possible they know a thing or two you don't know. But people don't like that, you know. They just talk to people who think the same way. And then they just stay stupid. And so that's, and that's not good. Because if you're not wise, the world will wallop you. It'll flatten you. And, and far more than it has to. And then you'll be bitter and resentful. And, you'll be part of that force that wallops, instead of the force that fights against that. We're having a conversation. I'm deciding I'm going to listen to you. Right? That's different than peop how people generally communicate. Because usually when they communicate, they're doing something like, okay, we're going to have a conversation, and I'm going to tell you why I'm right, and I'll win if you agree. Or maybe you're having a conversation where, I don't know what you're trying to do. Maybe you're trying to impress the person you're talking to. So you're not listening to them at all. You're just thinking about what you're going to say next. Okay, so that's not this. This is, you might have something to tell me. And so I'm going to listen on the off chance that you'll tell me something that would really be useful for me to know. And so you could think about it as an, as an extension of the Piagetian... You know, Piaget talked about the fundamental... The fundamentally important element of knowledge being to describe how knowledge is sought, the process by which knowledge is generated. Well, if you agree with me and I find that out, I know nothing more than I knew before. I just know what I knew before. And maybe I'm happy about that because, you know, it didn't get challenged. But I'm no smarter than I was before. 
but maybe you're different than me and so while I'm listening to you, you'll tell me something I wouldn't, I don't like. Maybe it's something I find contemptible or difficult, whatever. Maybe you'll find, you'll tell me something I don't know and then I won't be quite as stupid. And then maybe I won't run painfully into quite as many things. And that's a really useful thing to know, especially if you live with someone and you're trying to make long-term peace with them, is they're not the same as you. And their way they look at the world and the facts that they pull out of the world aren't the same as your facts. And even though you're going to be overwhelmed with the proclivity to demonstrate that you're right, it is the case that two brains are better than one. And so maybe nine of the 10 things they tell you are dispensable, or maybe even 49 out of 50, but one thing, all you need to get out of the damn conversation is one thing you don't know. And one of the things that's very cool about a good psychotherapeutic session is that the whole conversation is like that. All you're doing is trying to express the truth of the situation as clearly as possible. That's it. And so, now, Roger's proposition, and I'll tell you why he derived it, was that if you have a conversation like that with someone, it will make both of you better. It'll make both of you psychologically healthier. So there's an implicit presupposition that the exchange of truth is curative. Well, that's a very cool idea. I mean, it's a very deep idea. Uh, I think it's the most profound idea. It's the, it's the idea upon, Western civil, upon which Western civilization, although not only Western civilization, is actually predicated. The idea that truth produces health. But for Rogers, that was the entire purpose of the Psychotherapeutic Alliance. You come to see me because you want to be better. You don't even know what that means necessarily, neither do I. We're going to figure that out together. But you come and you say, look, things are not acceptable to me, and maybe there's something I could do about that. So that's the minimal precondition to engage in therapy. Something's wrong, you're willing to talk about it truthfully, and you want it to be better. Without that, the therapeutic relationship does not get off the ground. And so then you might ask, well, what relationships are therapeutic? And the answer to that would be, if you have a real relationship, it's therapeutic. If it isn't, what you have is not a relationship. God only knows what you have. You're a slave, they're a tyrant. You know, you're both butting heads with one another. It's a primate dominance hierarchy dispute. Oh, I don't know, you're like two cats in a barrel or two people with their hands around each other's throats. But you, what you have is not a relationship. So, all right. We may say that the greater the communicated congruence of experience, awareness, and behavior on the part of one individual, that's, that's a reference to the same idea that I was describing with regards to Jung. So let's say you come and talk to me and you want things to go well. Well, I'm going to have to more or less be one thing because if I'm all over the place, you can't trust any continuity in what I say. There's no, and you, there's no reason for you to believe that I'm capable of actually telling you I'm capable of expressing anything that's true. So the truth is something that emerges as a consequence of getting yourself lined up and beating all the, what would you call, all the impurities out of your, out of your, out of your soul, for lack of a better word. You have to be integrated for that to happen, and you do that at least in part by wanting to tell the truth. The more the ensuing relationship will involve a tendency towards reciprocal communication with the same qualities. So, one of the things, as I've been quite influenced by Rogers, one of the things I try to do in my therapeutic sessions is first of all to listen, to really listen. And then, well, while I listen, I watch. And while I'm listening, things will happen in my head. You know, maybe I'll get a little image of something, or I'll get a thought, or a question will emerge, and then I'll just tell the person what that is. But it's sort of directionless, you know? It's not like I have a goal, except that we're trying to make things better. I'm on the side of the person I'm on the side of the part of the person that wants things to be better, not worse. And so then we, those parts of us have a dialogue and the consequence of that dialogue is that certain things take place and then I'll just tell the person what happened. And it isn't that I'm right. That's not the point. The point is, is that they get to have an hour where someone actually tells them what they think. Here's the impact you're having on me. You know, this is making me angry. This is making me happy. This is really interesting. This reminds me of something that you said an hour ago that I don't quite understand. And the whole, the whole point is not for either person to 
make the proposition or convince the other that their position is correct, but merely to have an exchange of experience about how things are set up. And it's extraordinarily useful for people because it's often difficult for anyone to find anyone to talk to that will actually listen. And so another thing that's really strange about this listening is that if you listen to people, they will tell you the weirdest bloody things so fast you just cannot believe it. So if you're having a conversation with someone and it's dull, it's because you're stupid. That's why. You're not listening to them properly because they're weird. They're like wombats or albatrosses or rhinoceroses or something. Like they're strange creatures. And so if you were actually communicating with them and they were telling you how weird they really are, it would be... It would be anything but boring. So, and you can ask questions. That's a really good way of listening. But, you know, one of Roger's points is, well, you have to be oriented properly in order to listen. And the orientation has to be, look, what I want out of this conversation is that the place we both end up is better than the place we left. That's it. That's what I'm after. And if you're not after that, you've got to think, why the hell wouldn't you be after that? What could you possibly be after that would be better than that? You walk away smarter and more well-equipped for the world than you were before you had the conversation, and so does the other person. Well, maybe if you're bitter and resentful and angry and anxious and, you know, generally annoyed at the world, then that isn't what you want. You want the other person to walk away worse than you too because you're full of revenge. But, you know, you'll get what you want if you do that. So... We know from our research that such empathic understanding, it's already defined that. I want to hear you, I want to hear what you have to say so we can clarify it and move forward. I want to have your best interests in mind, and mine as well, but, you know, both at the same time. And your families too, if we can manage that. Uh, we're after making things better. We know from our research that such empathic understanding, understanding with a person, not about them, is such an effective approach that it can bring about major changes in personality. Some of you may be feeling that you listen well to people and that you have never seen such results, the chances are very great that you have not been listening in the manner that I've described. Fortunately, I can suggest a little experiment that you can do to test the quality of your understanding. The next time you get into an argument with your wife or your friend or a small group of friends, stop the discussion for a moment and for an experiment institute this rule. Each person can speak up for himself only after he has first restated the ideas and feelings of the previous speaker accurately. And what accurately means is they have to agree with your restatement. Now that's an annoying thing to do because if someone is talking to you and you disagree with them, the first thing you want to do is take their argument, make the stupidest possible thing out of it that you can, that's the straw man, and then demolish it. It's like... So then you can walk away feeling good ab about it and, you know, you primate domins dominated them really nicely. So, but that isn't what you do. You say, okay, well, I'm going to take what you told me and maybe I'm even going to make your argument stronger than the one you made. That's useful if you're dealing with someone that you have to live with because maybe they can't bloody well express themselves very well, but they have something to say. So you make their argument strong. All right, then you see what this would mean. It would mean that be before presenting your own point of view, it would be necessary for you to really achieve the other speaker's frame of reference, to understand his thoughts and feelings so well that you could summarize them for him. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But if you will try it, you'll find that it's the most difficult thing that you've ever done. Okay, good. We'll leave it at that, and then we'll see you on Tuesday.